Welcome everyone to week two of the live youth work conversations. This week we're talking about loss, which we know there are so many different conversations and questions that people have got at this time. But first of all, we just want to introduce everybody. So Ben, do you want to say hey to those that didn't tune in last week? Hi, yeah, I'm Ben. I'm from Blackburn. Um, I'm the DYO or the youth advisor in Blackburn Diocese. So yeah. And Susie, do you want to introduce yourself? Thank you, Dawn. Afternoon, everybody. I'm Susie. I'm the Youth Officer in Manchester Diocese. Fantastic. And Rod, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, I'm Rod. Uh, I'm a vicar uh, of a parish in Rossendale uh, and also an area dean. So yeah, keep those two hats going. Wow. And I'm involved in lots of, over the years, in lots of youth work um, through a charity that we have called the White Horse Project. Fantastic. So lots of experience. Uh, and my name's Dawn. I'm uh, part of the Children, Young People and Families team in the Leeds Diocese. Uh, so we're here just to kind of talk about loss. So we're going to start with a, a bit of a, a silly question, first of all, before we pray and, and start things. So what is the most annoying thing that you've lost? Hmm. Anyone want to start on that one? OK, so this is a quick one. Uh, I went shopping, it's like uh, a big shop, before we went into lockdown when shopping was probably a little bit uh, less stressful than it is at the moment. And um, it was one of those occasions when you still had half a bottle of shampoo left, but all of your conditioner had gone. So I went for a buy one, get one free in the chemist aisle and uh, bought a new shampoo and conditioner. I'm packing in the kitchen, putting everything away and literally could not find it. I knew I'd bought it, knew I'd put it in my bag. And for nearly three hours, I looked for it until a little bit later in the afternoon, I had a cup of tea and opened the fridge door. And lo and behold, I had stacked it alongside the milk in the door of the fridge. There you go. Just be careful as you unpack your shopping would be my tip of the day. <laughs> I love that. At least you didn't try and put it in your tea because that yeah. would be slightly annoying. <laughs> yeah. Or anyone... wash my hair with mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone else lost something that's been really annoying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many, many, many moons ago when I was a student, um, I lost my car. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, me and a, a couple of mates, uh, we were at uni in Leeds um, and we, <laughs> Ben's going, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we were at uni in Leeds and uh, we went to York for the day got plenty of time as students you know uh, so we went to York for the day parked the car went off enjoyed the, the sights of York and, and then we were looking for the car and we couldn't find the car anywhere and um, I'm, I'm panicking uh, um, so goes up to a policeman and, and, and says can you help me um, you know I've lost my car um, it's not where it's nowhere it should be she said, where, where did you leave it? I said, well, I left it in such and such a car park. He said, that car park's on the other side of the river. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I love it. At least you kind of had an idea where you'd parked it. <laughs> Brilliant. What about you, Ben? Have you ever lost anything annoying? Do you know what? It's during lockdown, um, last week, last week is probably about the time, probably the same day that we did this last week, um, last Tuesday, and my daughter is four so really classically helpful um and our tv it, don't judge me as a parent but my tv had been running that long that it decided to shut itself down um and um yeah and so and yeah she she goes daddy the numbers are on the tv as it counts down to turning off um rushes in and dra grabs my hand drags me through and i'm searching for about 25 minutes only for her to then stand up but after I've said, come on, come and help, come on out. She didn't do that. Stands up eventually and it's tucked just behind her down the back of the cushion of the sofa where she then walked back in and sat down. So um, I felt a bit of a melon, but you know, that, yeah, it was quite annoying for 25 minutes of my life. So. Mine is a, a very classic, I've lost my car keys. So we were, we were packing the tent away a few years ago in a rainy day in Wales, absolutely pouring it down as it often does in Wales. Uh, and we got ready to kind of leave the campsite and we had lost the keys and I'm like oh my goodness 
searching the whole car. I don't know if you've ever been camping with three kids, but you have a lot of stuff in your car. In the end, we decided to unpack the tent and actually go searching through the tent. We got so soaking wet. I said to my son, let's just, just give it a break. Let's go and change into our, our clean, dry clothes. As I took my jacket off, the keys were in my jumper. <laughs> Brilliant. Really awful, really, really not very good. But there are so many times that we, we lose things. And although often it can be funny, we're here obviously talk about the serious side of, of loss and, and COVID-19 and what that's brought as well. So just before we start the conversation, we'll just um, we'll just um, have a time of prayer. So Lord, thank you for this time in this conversation that we'll have. Thank you for those online watching and thank you for all the wisdom that, uh, that, that we all have. Lord, we just ask that you'll speak to us during this time. Amen. Amen. So Susie, we'll hand over to you. Thank you, Dawn. Thanks very much. Good to have you with us, Rod. And uh, great to have folks tuning in on the Facebook page and engaging in the conversation. The way that we're going to take it this afternoon is to look at four questions around loss and grief and uh, our current situation. Uh, we shouldn't avoid talking about death, I don't think, with young people at all in the best of circumstances. So it's really important for us to take some time to think about how uh, we might be dealing with this situation as it stands in terms of loss and look at how it impacts our local churches and our communities. We're going to then steer into thinking a bit more about how do we accompany young people through um, loss and grief and mourning uh, and then move on to discuss a little bit more of other types of loss young people might be experiencing at this time, like rites of passage and those who finish school earlier and not taking their exams. There's a multiple amount of issues for young people at the moment where there's loss and a sense of grief. And then we're going to finish off by thinking a bit about um, what are the resources available to us to help support us. We've got a whole plethora of uh, helpful links and uh, books and other helpful resources uh, that will go up at the end of the conversation, but also any practical ideas of how uh, we might be able to support the young people at the moment. So I'm gonna start and uh, the first question that we've got, and I want to kind of ask Rod about this, being in the real kind of heart of a parish up in the north of our diocese, uh, where you've been for how many years is it now? Uh, 17, yes, 17. So you're yeah. known and you make it your business to to get yeah. to know people in that community has certainly been my experience of you, Rodin. Yeah. So what, what's been your experience over these last uh, couple of months of loss and uh, and grief in your part of, uh, of, of the diocese? Well, I think I think one of the things that I'd, I'd say, first of all, that actually we have been probably sheltered from the worst impact of COVID-19. Um, maybe it's because we're a bit, we are a bit more rural. Mm. So we've, you know, we, we prepared ourselves for, you know, almost a tidal wave of uh, bereavement coming our way. And we, we've not had that. Mm. Um, but that's not to say that there hasn't been uh, loss and bereavement. And, and in particular, uh, one a case I can think of somebody um, from my own parish, not a, a COVID death, but somebody who was caught up in the the, the midst of the, the the crisis in a sense because uh, he died whilst abroad, and the whole struggle of um, bringing his body home and the difficulties then and the, the, the lengthening of the process uh, over which people are having to just simply make preparations for that that time of saying farewell. So, you know, we, we, we're probably talking a month between somebody dying and a funeral. And th th that, I think, is a, a terrible thing to to be waiting in that kind of limbo for that, that amount of time. Um, so that, that's probably the, the most impactful way that uh, it, it, it's hit home to, to me uh, mm -hmm. in terms of bereavement. Uh, colleagues around here, they've been, they have been conducting COVID funerals. Um, 
and their experience has been hard. They, they, they've not felt that they've been able to minister as they would to families. Uh, you know, because you can't get alongside them in the same way. Um, for those those people who might have been known to you, who it would have been natural to, to come alongside and just give them a, a hug, you can't do that. So they're, they're feeling a sense of loss uh, and you're in ministry, you're feeling that you're not able to do what you've been called to do. Mm. It must be hard as a parish priest as a vicar to what you would normally tend to do is go and visit the family and be with them physically in in their lounge and talking about the the person who's died and doing follow-up visits as well and now none of that is possible no. are, there, are there ways in which you can have been able to support those folks um without obviously by social distancing being one of you know that we need to adhere to yeah i mean i think i think it's uh, you know the simple thing about making a call, making a phone call, um, uh, and I know people have just valued that so much mm. that you you are still there for them. They they understand that you can't be in the the same physical place, but you are present to them. And I think that's what counts. It's presence. Um, uh, and, and, and I know that that ministry of presence is something that's so, so, so important. I was listening to um, uh, Rick and Kay Warren um, through Holy Trinity Brompton on, on Sunday. And Kay was talking very much about that ministry of presence in grief. Mm-hmm. And when you do it, and when you're having to do that at a distance, you think well, maybe it's not the case. But uh, I, I think we have to 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 imagine more in these yeah. circumstances, and it's it's stretching at all of our imaginations. Yeah, I think those are really powerful things you've said, Rod, about presence. And <laughs> excuse me, we associate presence with physicality, but actually by ringing people up or sending a card and then knowing that you're still there for them is is really, really critical. And that sense of being imaginative in how we support people in their, in their loss and their grief, um, that's hugely inspiring. Thank you so much. Um, I wonder now, just thinking a bit about young people and um, last year I did a bit of reading around loss and death and for young people particularly. and some really interesting reports out there and some good books and uh, folks with plenty of uh, experience as well. And um, I read in a, um, a report that it said that as many as 92% of young people in the UK will experience what they see as a sig- significant bereavement before the age of 16. And we need to include that that's not just people, but that's animals that have been pets and as much part of the family as as anybody else as well and um uh, uh, it makes me think about everything else young people have to navigate during those critical years of adolescence and puberty and the transitions that take place during those periods of time how do we accompany uh, the young people through those real peaks and kind of hilltops of loss and grief and the expression of that grief through mourning. How do we how do we do that? How do we begin to even accompany them through that and support them, do you think? Is that to me? Yeah, anyone really. But... <laughs> it was the, there, was a, there was a pregnant pause there and I was thinking, <laughs> oh, was that meant to come back to me? <laughs> well, yeah. you kick us off, Rod, that'd be great, thank you. Yeah, um, I mean, I think uh, g- g- going back to my own experience, um, uh, there was one particular year, it was probably about five years ago, where the projects that we were working with, in that year, we um, experienced in Rossendale mm. suicide of three young people who we knew. Um, or uh, people who were coming to the project knew directly. Um, And I think that um, 
for me, what what was most important at that time is that we didn't push things with young people, but that we were there and then they came and they just wanted to talk. And the, the, I think the greatest gift we could give is listening. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely just about creating that safe space, isn't it, within the community that they know, to just be able to come and not say or speak or whatever it is, but just creating that real safe, safe space where they can just come and be. I think that's so important, so important. It's really great that you could create that, Rod. Really, really great. Uh, and I think they wanted they wanted to be creative. I mean, I, I know someone came and they they uh, they, they created. Uh, some some artwork they created other things that they wanted to just put up uh, something very you know rudimentary but uh, it was an expression of the way that they were feeling so give them give them the ability and the space not only to express themselves verbally but in other ways as well yeah. I think this time has allowed more creativity. There's um, a, a lady from a, a church where I live um, died. She was the Sunday school teacher for about 40 years, so for a long, long, long time, and, and died due to uh, contracting COVID-19. Uh, and they obviously, you can't go to the funeral, what, what can you do? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it was the young people that actually decided, hey, let's do something really creative. So they actually um, worked out with the funeral director which way they were going to travel uh, and just kind of did it all by Facebook Live and people were able to come out and still feel part of the community, still able to grieve, but obviously within the constraints of COVID-19, what you know, how that brings it as well. So mm -hmm. Ben, any thoughts from you, sir? I think one of the things that always yeah, it's always struck me about um, supporting young people when around bereavement is is we need to be gentle, um, and I think sometimes is and I know that that's probably the that is very much the case with so many different um, yeah with all age groups. But I think there's sometimes particularly I, and I, I and I'm well, like Susie and I have got a similar background in the sense that we have both been school chaplains, and I think sometimes in a school setting particularly there mm. and this is not an insult on our, our teaching colleagues. Um, a, Far from it but actually sometimes because life carries on in school there's a kind of yeah just kind of you know just bottle it and go and I think actually sometimes is that creating that space is really important but how we then interact with them has got to be really gentle and I think and, and the other thing alongside that is it's like the assumption that nothing we can't assume anything so we can't we can't project the relationship we had with a parent or the projection of a relationship we have with a youth leader or a children's leader whoever the lost the, the person who's died is mm. and we can't project that onto them because all relationships are different and i think that's that's really key so the assumption that you know this is going to be one a massive hole or or okay that person for me i would probably cope with that differently actually doesn't mean that's not massive for for a young person and so therefore i think yeah, I think that as essence of kind of being present, but maybe not necessarily kind of right in your face. Proximity mm. doesn't equal presence, does it? As as Rod said before. So I think there's that that really kind of vital thing of saying, I'm here, mm. you know where I am, and I'll check in. But but where do we go? And um, and I think that's yeah, I think that's that's kind of part of it. And and I think that's one of the difficulties when we think through some of this is that particularly in this kind of setting and kind of ministering from home if you like which kind of feels a bit odd anyway is is sometimes that gentleness and that lack of assumption can get lost with like written word or a phone call or uh, do you know what i mean that kind of almost that lack of proximity sometimes feels like we lose some of the the the, the compassion and the sensitivity within how we deal with young people and i think that's just something i've I've observed, um, particularly where, um, and I've heard of, and I, fortunately, I'm very blessed in the sense I've not had sort of experiences really close to home, but there's a, the stories that come through of kind of, you know, people that have lost family members through COVID-19 and then the family's choice that because they had COVID-19 and they're not sure if they've got it, that they're not going to hold a funeral at all. In fact, they might accompany the, the hearse to a, to, to a, um, a crematorium but actually no one goes in and there's there's not massive amounts kind of goes there's nothing not like a family even a family point 
Um, and I think that's so confusing for, for young people. Um, and how do we start, how do we allow kind of, how do we get alongside them without that proximity? And, and I think that's kind of a huge, huge mm -hmm. thing that we, that we, yeah, is part of that processing of what we're talking about today, isn't it? It's like, how do we get alongside them? And, yeah. you know, it's, it's, that, it's that ministering from a distance. Like, so. It is. I think you're absolutely right. I think um, I think it's really interesting that uh, about the creation of safe space and how tricky that is to do at the moment in our virtual world. Um, and even though you know we know others are watching this and uh, we know that other people use Zooms for kind of wider meetings, how safe can a visual conversation online be? Uh, is a phone call a bit? safer in terms of nobody else kind of interfering with the conversation but how is a uh, how do we go about creating a safe space in this current situation where young people are grieving in a household where others are grieving and maybe finding it really hard to talk about how they feel uh, because they see all around them other people who are uh, really struggling with loss as well um, are there ways in which we can you know, uh, Dawn's brought out some really great ideas and Ben, uh, are there other ways in which we can create safe space for young people to talk during these times so that they know that, that we're there for them, that, that they know that we're, we're present with them? Mm. Any thoughts on that, Rod? I th well, I think that, that one of the things that um, we've, we've been finding in connecting with young people is that, um, there's a split between those who want to be seen and those who don't want to be seen mm. at all. And I think I, I think we've got to give space um, for both. Uh, and I think it's true of adults as well. Actually, there are some who who uh, you know are almost longing to get on Zoom like this and be be seen. And there are those who are off camera. But they're present, and yeah, I think yeah. I, I think we've got to um, work, you know, creatively in allowing people to engage in whichever form they feel comfortable, and not think, oh, the only answer is create something like this. Yeah, that's it doesn't, nice. doesn't suit everybody. Yeah, that's so wise, Rod, because there will be people who will want to talk, and there'll be people who will who need to just process it for themselves and withdraw. And that's that's really, really helpful. One of the things that people are chatting about on the chat at the moment, and I think this is a really interesting question uh, in terms of thinking about how we accompany young people through loss and bereavement. Um, I mean, we said earlier on that it's not something that we maybe talk enough to young people about, um, but, uh, we don't normally kind of have regular conversations about what it means, what does death mean, what, what is, where is hope in death and what's our theological perspective, um, you know, in, in loss and grief. But do you think that there is a difference between the bereavements that we're experiencing now because of this pandemic to bereavements in whatever normal time means anymore? Do you think there is a difference um, in those different types of senses of loss or are they much the same do you think i wonder if there's an, an added level level of confusion there's always a level of questioning isn't there around bereavement particularly if it's someone young or someone younger mm. and and i wonder whether this gives another level of confusion to it mm. um in the sense of kind of actually trying to process what's going on in the world more widely as well as what's going on in that mm. yeah in your kind of sphere of uh, of impact in and yeah, so I wonder if the, there is a slight difference. I wonder for others whether or not there's what we'll see is that actually there's that lack of proximity means that we we see a delay in in that bereavement. Mm. Um, I particularly consider kind of going back to schools and what we see over those and and over the next couple of months and maybe even if schools don't go some secondary school years don't go back till the after the summer is just seeing those young people suddenly land with a group of friends who they've not seen in that mm -hmm. kind of that that that's their safe place if that's the place they feel that they can articulate how they're feeling um and they maybe struggle like suddenly maybe we'll see like um yeah almost a delay in bereavement and that mm -hmm. processing yes. yeah. um 
and that that might be that yeah that might well be something that is that, that i think is possibly different um and i think therefore and it's kind of skips back to the last one in, in some ways how we communicate and contact young people mm. at the time is, is really is actually really key isn't it and I, I totally agree with what rod said in terms of go hey we'll have a we'll have a group zoom let's have a group zoom and you can sit with you for it. like actually that's possibly not good that's not probably isn't going to be the thing but, mm. but there's there's certain things like you, you can create and i don't know what the right word is so kind of the right phrase but almost like a comfort parcel that's something that says we love you we care for you we're here yeah. here's some res- not resources like we don't print off a load of coloring sheets but like um, but actually something that says, hey, if, if you need someone to talk, this is somewhere you can talk to. If you someone you don't want to talk, you want to talk to someone, but you don't know them, like here's some other people you could talk to. Mm, mm. Um, and here's some things you might want to try. And if you want someone to walk alongside you within this, then like, that's right. Uh, we're here. Or if you want us to point you in the direction, it's those sorts of things that just says, hey, here's, here's some chocolate. Here's <laughs> like all really practical things as well that just say like, we want to shower you a little bit with some love. Um, that actually probably kind of just helps them go, oh, do you know what, they're, they're here as well. And I think that's, yeah. Brilliant. And those are places where uh, where we, we <coughs> where God is present and that they're not on their own and that, that, we, that we want to encourage uh, young people to know that God is close and, and with them. Um, Rachel um, Sheffer has just put up on the chat that some of her suggestions about creating space or a sacred space would be maybe around lighting candles at home. Some use of symbolism uh, could be really supportive and encouraging. You know, as you were talking earlier about the funeral, people lining the streets mm. where they can remember that person. And uh, some have talked about tying ribbons to trees. And these are all symbolic acts, aren't they? That uh, talk of of yeah. being alongside each other and remembering somebody yeah i mean i, I, th- I think that the whole rainbow thing is you know you you go around a uh, community and you just see these rainbows in windows now uh, I, th- I think that speaks uh, to a lot of it's expressing something on the part of those youngsters who are doing that um and and it's something that we can build on you know something tangible that is, is, is saying we remember. Yeah. We remember. It's almost that that whole idea that we that we live in a in a mourning adverse kind of culture is almost shifting, isn't it? In the sense that we've, we're all confronted with the awfulness of so many people losing their lives to coronavirus that uh, that we it's almost okay now to talk about loss and death in in mm. that way, and I think that's extraordinarily powerful. Um, just thinking a bit more about young people and just uh, about other losses they might be experiencing. What are some of what are some of the experiences that you folks have had around other experiences of loss and grief that young people might be uh, navigating at the moment during this time? Dawn, what what, what are your mm-hmm. thoughts on that? So my son is uh, year year eleven and his girlfriend is year 13. So they both suffered loss of rite of passage. So uh, my son will often say, we'll be known as the Corona year. That's what we'll be known as. (laughs) People will look at my GCSEs and go, you did not take your exam. Not only loss of exams, but loss of prom, loss of getting, uh, we we had to self-isolate so he couldn't get his shirt signed book signed, all those normal, normal things that we do as a society when we're, you know, leaving a significant portion of our education, all of that has, has now gone. Mm-hmm. Um, so for him, it's very, very significant, definitely. Although probably less so now, now he knows he hasn't got to do his exams, but still there's a, you know, you think about the girls with their proms and yeah. a lot of them have already bought dresses and found hairdressers and designed their nails and all those kind of things that we might think are really kind of frivolous but are actually really really important right of passage mm. for someone in year 11. Yeah definitely absolutely. Mm. Mm. I, I wonder it, whether, yeah I, I wonder if there's there's something there's probably two things that pop to mind naturally one is probably a loss of structure mm-hmm. that that kind of uh, however much <laughs> school school is one is love hate things isn't it like on one hand we we hate being there because we have to be there um but actually that the structure it allows and and the kind of almost just the rhythm to life mm. um i i can speak as a as a 35 year old that 
yeah, the loss of that structure and rhythm of going up and going out to work took a long time to get past. Mm -hmm. And at, mm -hmm. at times I probably still struggle with it. So the thought process of going, I've got to do school, but without that structure, I think has probably been a massive loss for a number of young people. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one is, it, and, and it probably rings a little bit in, in, in line with and, and resonates with what Dawn's just said, is that loss of summer. Mm -hmm. um, a potential loss of holiday or that loss of something to look forward to mm -hmm. um, I'm aware that kind of you know my youth group we were due to go off to we have to go, go to DTI we've been a sole survivor with something like that's been cancelled um, other things have been pulled like I was meant to do you know what I was meant to be in America right now that's gone um, I say that with a smile on my face because the, th the thought process just feels so weird but it's you know actually those things that are you know, those different things that we maybe been looking forward to mm. with that added level of confusion, not knowing when it happened or when we'll be able to do that again, I think possibly is, mm. is a huge area of loss for a lot of people, not just young people. But I think that I'll finish exams and then I've got I'm going to go do this or I've got that to look mm. forward to. Maybe mm. just is. So, that yeah, just, absolutely. I think there's also something in the whole uh, struck because I know a few young people who were due to take A-levels this summer and uh, GCSEs and one of them said to me which was really powerful that um, it's not just the fact that I'm not able to do them this summer and even though my work will count massively to the grade that I get in August um, you know, when we, when we were like 10 years later and people say, oh, what, what did you get in your GCSEs? There may not be the same kind of level of, oh, this is my accomplishment, even though it is their accomplishment at the end of the day, that they never got to sit their exams. Now, not everyone is a fan of exams. I appreciate that. But for some young people, they flourish under that pressure and to not have the opportunity to sit them, I think, is uh, for one of one of the young people that I was talking to is a particular struggle. But, but also what does... Uh, does that impact their identity in any way? Does that, you know, do they have that sense of, of loss around not having been able to see through their academia to sit in a hall with, you know, 250 other young people mm. uh, writing their GCSE biology paper? And, and that matters to the young people that I spoke to uh, completely. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that um, in, in, in terms of, of, of what I've been processing over this uh, and I agree with uh, Dawn and Ben entirely and, and particularly that loss of, of structure that loss of uh, discipline loss of routine uh, it's gone out the window and I think that is going to be so hard to get to get back uh, but one one of the things that I, I think we we haven't actually got through the experiences of loss that our young people are going to to have because you know at the moment it's the exam phase they haven't got to that uh, this is our period of, of summer free time phase so they've not you know they've not lost that yet but they're going to lose that yeah. and, and, and then the experience of finding out what your exam results are, it's not going to be the same. You, they're going to get exam results, but they're not exam results. Mm -hmm. So the, I think a lot of the losses are still to come. Yeah. Um, and one other thought, uh, you know, I was I was talking with, with, with Jill about, about this, and um, she said that for many of the, the young people, particularly who we deal with this is just another set of losses on top of all the other losses that they've experienced in their lives mm. whether it be um you know significant relationships of their own um mm. or um, relationships with uh, uh, parents or step parents or uh, life is, is is just become so transient yeah. It's mm -hmm. so fleeting. Yeah. Here's another set of losses. So that actually we're building up um, for many young people the experience that life is all about mm. loss. Mm. Yeah. So I think I think that's yeah. really worrying in the long term. Yeah. Absolutely. 
we have to remember those families that really aren't coping in this time as well with the, the, the loss of so many loved ones where family life comes under so much pressure that there's almost loss of that kind of whole parental family structure that you have as well to the point where families are deciding, parents are deciding that's it, I, I can't do it anymore, we're going to have to separate or divorce. So you've not only got a young person dealing with all the school and the lack of structure and the death, but also potentially divorce and separation of parents as well. And that's huge. Mm -hmm. That's massive. Yeah. yeah. And it ties in so much with uh, with mental health and uh, well-being as well. And we're going to look at that in a couple of weeks time and how we support our young people and their well-being, mental health and mental well-being during this time. But it, it connects into that so much, doesn't it? It feels like uh, a, a, almost an avalanche of loss upon them. And mm -hmm. somehow we need to excavate through the snow to, to find ways to support them uh, because of who they are, not because of any kind of uh, list to-do list that we might find in a resource book, but to understanding their own unique situations and their own context and what else they're struggling with at the same time. It's, as you've said, what is really key, isn't it? I, th I think that um, one of the, one of the things that uh, you know a conversation with uh, one young person that brought to mind is the fact that everything happens suddenly, mm -hmm. um, and things that you might have been processing and, and going through, like maybe you were experiencing a difficulty with uh, a friendship, and you you know your, your last words were fairly negative towards one another mm. and you've not had the chance to actually put things right because it, it doesn't feel right to to call or to text or to go on social media or, or, or whatever to sort that out and so yeah. there's a, a almost a period of limbo and and the damage that that's doing to um, you know, people's well-being, yeah. loss of relationship, yeah. and I think that links with that. Mm. It links with that kind of further thought about kind of exams and things like that. That there's that, and I know it's a weird link, but in some ways, there's that lack of closure, that lack of finishing. Mm. There's yes. the ability to, like, I'm, I have to admit, if I fall out with someone, I want to solve that yeah. quick. But but it's always like I want to see them, like, and and I think it's the same for young people. It's the same for everyone, isn't it? But equally, like with exams, it's like, I want to, I want to finish that. I want mm. to close that. I want to have done that really well. And actually, in some ways, they, they want more than the loss of the ability to finish that well. Mm. Uh, and 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 it, not that I'm kind of trying to read comments as I go at all, um, but something just popped up and caught my eye was actually that there's also the loss for the year groups that are going to do exams next year, yeah. mm. which I think is huge. That actually, they're going to lose best part of a term of focus on their work, that rhythm, that, all those things. Um, and then they have to go into like this big exam year next year and you kind of go, oh, OK, that's going to be huge yeah. as they go into that. And I think there is. Yeah. And I think it, as we've discussed all these different kinds of loss, it's yeah, it, it, it's huge for young people to process. Um, I guess my I guess if I put my kind of youth worker hat on massively, not that I take it off very often, but, but it's actually there's there's such a huge opportunity within all of this as well. Mm -hmm. um to help to help them to, to so to process and i know that we're talking about how we do that but there's such an opportunity to be creative to be positive mm -hmm. um, and and i guess as a, as a christian community that i imagine or we all are and and i imagine a number of the people watching are is just that ability to speak hope and that transformational love of jesus into into those situations which i'm not saying that's the don't get me wrong i'm not someone that goes hey we'll just jesus will Jesus has the ability to transform so mm. don't hear what I'm not saying and I'm not someone that also goes we don't have to do anything because Jesus um but I think there's that balance isn't it like we have that hope and we have that joy and that peace mm. um and and equally though we also have that that ability that God given ability to be creative and compassionate and 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 so that creates an opportunity in the midst of all of this i'm really aware we just we've listed loads and loads of losses i just wanted to kind of remind us yeah, that absolutely that's that opportunity and mm. i think that it's just it, it's humbling i think when i and I, that's been my experience being a youth leader being a school chaplain whenever um death has become part of that a, a community it's always humbling to get alongside those young people mm. 
and it always feels like an opportunity just to speak and minister God's love to them, whether that's directly because of proximity or whether that's just sort of being present and allowing them to know you're around. And, and that's just huge. And I think that's, that's, yeah. And it's how we do that for the, for each young person is going to be massive in this season. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I think hope is critical, isn't it? It always is, always will be that uh, we're people who who speak a message of hope that never changes, despite anything and everything that happens in our world. That that hope remains the same in Jesus. And it, <clears throat> when you, while you were talking, Ben, I was just thinking, actually, uh, when we talk to young people about hope, it's not just about giving them hope, but equipping them to be people who bring hope too. And so much of this accompanying of young people, I think, is done so powerfully between friends, isn't it? That where there's a sense of loss and where young people are feeling low uh, and feeling like they've missed out and are going through all of these experiences, um, it's an opportunity to continue to empower our young people <clears throat> that we work with, the uh, young people that we know to be hope bringers, as well as, uh, you know, people who hear, mes- hear the message of hope, giving them the confidence to speak that into the lives of their friends in such a way that it brings them uh, that unshakable hope that we have. I think that's, um, I think you're, you're dead on the nail there, Ben, around, you know, being people who bring hope. I think it's really important. Um, just coming to the, like the last kind of thoughts um, about kind of practical ways and we've come up with some through this so uh, we may not want to kind of add any more um, but just thinking maybe a bit about um, what are some of the resources out there that might be available to us but also uh, another thought is um, what how do we uh, sort of where do we start with the sense of loss when things begin to get back to whatever normal might look like what, what when we're able to kind of be amongst people uh whether that's you know two meters apart but when we're able to see each other are there ways in which we can support each other effectively when things begin to uh open and we're able to kind of be together in small groups and families again do you think about that Rod have you thought about that yourself in terms of your ministry I wonder and how we kind of do that and I th- well I think when we first went into lockdown uh, I heard a lot uh, of people saying now when we come out of lockdown we're going to have a big party <laughs> great uh, but it's not going to be like that it's it's going to be gradual it's going to be bits and pieces uh and and i think uh, we actually want to be careful about the expectations that we are setting up now for when we do come out of lockdown mm-hmm. because otherwise we could be creating a whole new set of problems mm-hmm. so uh, I think we need to encourage people that it's going to be a gradual process. We need to encourage people that it's um, it is going to be about presence again. Going back to something I said earlier, but we are going to be able to be present to one another physically, mm-hmm. and then we just need to give people space. Yeah, and let's. Let, let, let's be rather than let's think that we're going to party. Yeah, brilliant. so wise. Thank you. And it just the other part of that question I wondered uh, to, uh, to everybody is, are there any kind of particular resources that, that you've read, anything good you've read that would be helpful? Um, any uh, kind of websites that you found really helpful that maybe others could read, have a look up on and get some support? some uh, advice and some good resources anything yeah Don't just eager just, to share <laughs> <laughs> just picking up on what uh what ben said really i think some organizations have really understood that um young people are going to experience loss when they go back into their school community when they are around finally around their friendship group so there's two organizations in particular that have are doing online webinars and online training specifically for educators and teachers. Uh, they are Child Bereavement UK, and they'll, I think they'll be on the link. Mm. Later. 
and also Winston's Wish as well. So it's just free training just for teachers who are obviously going into a situation where uh, they don't know what they'll be going into really. They'll be dealing with all sorts of issues over a long period of time. And it's just really just to kind of offer some advice and to skill up teachers maybe in, in bereavement and how to support young people. Yeah, brilliant, thank you. Ben, anything you'd like to suggest, recommend? There's, there's so much, that, there is genuinely so much good stuff that is that can be and and is and I think I'd, I'd echo what Dawn has said in terms of those um, in terms of those two and I think um, two others that I'd throw in would be griefencounter.org.uk um, um, and cruise c-r-u-s-e mm. uk just both both have done really kind of bit yeah both have got loads of advice on particularly around coronavirus and how yeah. you support children young people um, and I think yeah I I think I think one of the things for generally my encouragement to children and youth workers would be just think practically as well when when it comes to kind of those and it is in it's cre it's creating that space that that Rod spoke about but how do we do that um, I know the things that we can do that we could do maybe in this time but actually is easy to do so like you know cooking meals and, mm -hmm. and things like that just that create that create a little bit of community that says yeah we're here for you and we're creating taking one pressure off you um yeah. that that is this really this really exciting um and and i think there's just that opportunity to say yeah we're, we're alongside each other again and we'll we'll create that and it may not be that you have to come and eat with us like we can can drop something around but i think that's just really practical as well and and i and i just yeah i'm as i said before i'm quite excited by the opportunity that there is here I don't like the fact that we're that we're facing deaths because of this and in this season, but yeah. there is an opportunity to to just be able to get alongside people and to love them, and I think that's exciting. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Rod. Anything you would like to kind of recommend or suggest? Uh, I think I think it's the it's the person. Yeah. You know, let's not let's not get away from the fact that um, it's about relationships actually. Mm. and you can only build those relationships over time mm. and you can you've got to keep being there for young people that's what that's what young people want more than anything else mm -hmm. they want to know that there's somebody there that they can come and yeah. um just pour out stuff on could kick against can you know shout at um but they know that there's that care so I think the greatest resource is actually mm. people yeah absolutely that's so profound you're such a wise man Rod Bevan thank you so much you I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> no but that's the real wisdom and really grateful for it um I read a book um called um Young People, Death and the Unfairness of Everything by a chap called Nick Luxmore. It's a really helpful book and he talks about kind of uh, making sure that we talk about it even outside of pandemic circumstances in all kinds of situations that, that death becomes something that we feel comfortable talking about even though it's, it's so enormous and having people around to be able to have those conversations is has clearly been really important to many people. And as Ben said earlier, when I was a chaplain in a high school, uh, we encountered death regularly in, in some extraordinarily tragic circumstances. And you're absolutely right, Rod, that people just weren't looking for answers. They just wanted to talk about how they felt about it. And many of the staff who were absorbing the sense of loss from the pupils that they were serving would find a bit of a safe space in the staff room and be processing their own questions. So it's having people around you who can help you to, to process that sense of loss. And um, Nick talks about kind of how young people need to talk about it and how, as you said earlier on, to, to be people who listen and how important that is. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have any magic answers, but we do have hope. Uh, and that hope is firm in Jesus. And, and I think um, we, you know, having the opportunities to, to, to share that hope too is really important. Uh, we're going to draw, uh, begin to draw this to a, a, an end. Um, uh, ben is going to have a, a bit of a chat now about how we want uh, youth work conversations to continue. And 
uh, its shape. But um, can I thank you, Rod, on behalf of the three of us and the number of folks who will have been following us on Facebook. Thank you for your wisdom and your insightfulness and your godliness and and for speaking such such wisdom and truth into uh, this really painful uh, subject. Um, I'm a big fan, you know that, but I'm so glad other people have got to hear your uh, your thoughts and reflections and of life in Rortonstall and kind of the work that you're doing there amongst the rest of the team up in the Rosendale Valley. So thanks for being with us today, for skipping out of a Zoom super quick and coming straight into this one. We really appreciate it. So thank great. you. Thank you so much. Please don't go. Do stay there till the end. And uh, I'll hand <laughs> over to Ben now, who will... Uh, Finish off for us. Thank yeah, you, Ben. Um, yeah, thank you so much, um, Susie. Thank you, Rod. Thank you, Dawn. We've it's been uh, it's been amazing this conversation. I think it's been really good, um, and probably one we should have had a long, long time ago. To be fair, um, but actually, this this these circumstances bring it around, um, bring things to the fore, don't they? Um, one thing that we we were as a as a group of us that you've seen four of our faces now, um, and there's a couple of us from a, a youth advisor, youth advisors across the north there putting this together and we would love to um, encourage this conversation to continue um, and therefore we'd encourage people to post um, and we've 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 been processing what that might look like and we just wanted to sort of share with you that that what we'd love to encourage is that um, the things that are posted the things that are um, yeah that are shared um, that, that continue the conversation that they are dialogue promoting um, and that actually that even if it's a new topic, that it starts a conversation, that it starts something that is um, helpful to the, the community that is growing here. Um, and, it, and it kind of adds to that conversation. We are um, obviously today we've been talking about bereavement. If you know resources, post them um, that you think would be helpful to people. If that's schools related, whether even that's children's work related, post it because it's it'll be really helpful to people. And um, we can't list everything and anything. Um, but but actually there's there's something of, of saying we how do we how do we speak into the conversation that's taking place and how do we um and, and do that and and i think that's the challenge to us um as we as we move forward with this we as a team want to say we're going to do a little bit better and it did fall on me this week so my apologies um that you found out this morning who our guest was and what the topic was but we're going to try and post that in a couple of days time to give people a heads up so actually that conversation can start and to start to kind of um yeah, so people can start to speak into that conversation ahead of us having it on screen. Um, so we'd, we'd love you to contribute in that way. Um, so please don't please don't feel that we're discouraging you from posting. In fact, we'd love you to continue to post and post um, things that, that continue this conversation, that continue the dialogue um, that we've we've created. And hopefully this is a helpful um, and an encouraging space to everyone that gets to be part of it. Um, so, yeah. So as we finish, let's pray and we'll... Yeah, we'll kind of, yeah, hopefully the conversation then carries on. But yeah, let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity to talk about such a vitally important um, topic, aspect of life um, that we face right now, that young people are facing. And we pray as a, as a youth work fraternity, as a group, as a, as a, as a kind of like-minded people, that, we, that you would give us um, ideas, you would give us creativity, give us moments of... Um, and just real clarity as to how to speak um, your love, your hope, um, and to get alongside and love young people in, in ways that um, we maybe have never thought of before. And God, we pray that you would, you would speak to us in those ways that are individual to those young people, that we, it isn't a, oh, it's a great idea for a group, but actually, God, that you allow us to speak to that, those individual young people, that you give us the wisdom and the discernment to know how to support them. And we pray for the young people that are already been impacted by um, by deaths and by just loss of different aspects of life through this time. God, we pray that you would, um, yeah, you would reveal more of your love, reveal more of who you are, and the hope that you give us, that hope that never fails, that hope that never goes away. God, um, to each of them, that they might know you more, and that this is a time where is hard but it is one that they get to know you and how much they can lean on you and rely on you in their lives so father god we pray all these things in your son jesus christ's name amen 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 great thanks so much everybody for joining us today thanks again ben dawn rod and everyone out there today and uh we look forward to seeing you next week 
and uh, check out the Facebook page for a bit of information about who will be joining us and the subject that we'll be chewing over. Good to see you. Take care and uh, we'll see you soon.